taking a week out from our regular psalm um, series. Just something that um, is something I've been thinking of talking about for a while, and then the issues come up. So I thought it's wise to talk about that now. So you might not have heard about this, but it is a, a bit of a way of coming up in the church. If you haven't heard of it, obviously um, you will have by the end of my message. But even if I hadn't chosen to speak about it today, you'll hear about it soon enough. It's something called spiritual formation. So the question is, what is spiritual formation? Well, it's fairly accurately named, which is nice for a change. <laughs> Sometimes I name these things in an odd way, but it's generally speaking, it's a movement in Christianity where people engage in certain practices and rituals to aid in formation, or really transformation, of their spirits into something that's meant to be more like Jesus Christ. And some of these practice, practices include things like contemplative prayer, labyrinths, and that's the, one of the pictures up there. That's um, lots of little candles all marking out a labyrinth. That's what that is. And other things, Lectio Divina, which is Latin for divine reading. Or even things like the Enneagram personality analysis. I don't know how many have heard of that one, but that sort of comes under this umbrella too. <coughs> And there are many more, but we'll tend to focus on those ones today, since they are central examples. Now, as far as the goal is concerned, and this, that's certainly a good thing, right? To become more like Jesus. That's great. We all need to become more like Jesus. So, okay, let's note that the intention is positive. But are these methods the right way to go about it? That's the question we need to ask. Now, while the current wave can be considered something new in Christendom, in a sense, it's actually stuff that's been happening for many centuries. They tend to trace its origin into what's called the Desert Fathers, because they tended to be men doing this, mostly. Now, these were people who would basically become hermits, and they lived very ascetic lives, you know, far removed from the general population, so obviously the wilderness and the desert and in the rocks and all that. So we would tend to call them monks, perhaps, or nuns if they were women. And some of the more well-known ones were Anthony the Great and John Chrysostom. You might, might have heard of John Chrysostom more. And their stated goal was and is, for those who do it today as well, as we said, uh, is to grow more like Christ. And they were pursuing it, though, in a more mystical way. And there's our first warning sign. And so their practices are now being picked up again and spread in the modern church. And I'll be up front and say I believe there are good reasons to be concerned about this trend. Not that there aren't some commendable parts, but the movement as a whole I think is problematic. And it's coming, and it's coming fast, so we need to talk about it. So that's why we're talking about it today. So how I plan to do this is firstly set down a few biblical principles for how God tells us spiritual growth occurs. And then once we set that foundation... Uh, compare some of the practices and see how they stack up. I suppose that's a pretty fair way of doing it, I think. So Jesus tells us what that is, um, what the fundamental part of spiritual growth. Um, when he quotes from Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, in his temptation by Satan in the desert, he says this, Matthew 4, verse 4. What's the fundamental part? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So what does he mean by that? Well, he means that our spiritual lives are not sustained by bread. That's just a summary word for natural food, basically. And I think by extension you could also say material things in general, just the material world is not what you grow spiritually by. I mean, you, there, God uses those things, but that's not what actually grows us. So where does it come from? The verse says, every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So it proceeds is the old-fashioned uh, translation, but every word that comes from God's mouth. And the word of God is what feeds our spiritual lives. So it's, it's fuel for the engine, if you like, or it's water for your garden. Think about it, it, it keeps those things going. So like a tree without water withers and dies, so a person's spiritual life without the word of God withers and dies. It's that direct. It's a direct correlation. So where do we find the Word of God? Do we just hope it just comes to our heads? No? In the Bible, yes. <laughs> That's right. It's in the Bible. That's why growing Christians strongly tend to be Bible-loving Christians. 
They have a desire for God's word. And you could say they devour it, they savour it, because it's the only reliable source of spiritual nourishment. And it works because God's spirit in our lives most powerfully works through God's word. Now it's not a mechanical thing, you know, it's, it's not a formula or anything, but it is a relational thing. Basically the Holy Spirit uses the word of God to show us who Jesus is. So you can say it's his autobiography. Jesus' autobiography, the book, God's autobiography. It's a, it's a personal thing, and it's, he's telling us about himself. And as we grasp those things, and then he brings our life through events which shape us. So that's where the hard things in life help to actually shape us too. As long as we're based on the word, those things should work the right way. And help smooth off our, all our worldly edges. And, and like I showed with the you know, building our body shape, <laughs> spiritual body shape, he does all those things in his word and, and in his way and in his time. So yes, the word of God is the fuel for our spiritual life. So if you take nothing else home from today, just please take that. The word of God is the fuel for your spiritual life. And Jesus says a similar thing to Matthew 4 verse 4 when he's praying for his followers in John 17 verse 7. He says, Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. Now, for our purposes today, sanctify means the same thing as grow, okay? So pretty much the same idea. It's part of the salvation that happens after we've been regenerated in Christ. So we're saved, regenerated, and then we should be growing and just being sanctified. So in that phrase, we are grown by what? What does the verse say we're grown by? The truth, yeah. And the truth, what's the truth? It's God's word, it's truth. It's the, the word of God the Father's Word specifically. But, so he's repeating that idea that growth is brought about through the Word of God. So what do we do with the Word of God then? To allow it to nourish our spiritual lives. How do we actually get the Word of God to sanctify us and grow us up? How does it happen? Read it. Yeah, that's a pretty simple answer, isn't it? Read it. That's the right answer. And by that we mean we take it into our minds, either by actually reading or hearing it, perhaps. You know, there's some good apps you can have the Bible read to you and stuff like that. And then we think about it and we ponder it, meditate on it. And if you really want to get deeper, you can try and explain it to somebody else. That's always a good way to learn better. All us who are teachers in this room and you realize, I never understood physics until I had to teach it. And then like, oh, this is cool, you know. <laughs> so... Teach it to someone else because it helps you have to, have to really grapple with what God's saying because you really don't fully grasp something until you can successfully explain it to someone else. So practice telling other people about what you learn in the, about Jesus in the Bible. It's certainly part of growing as a believer, I think, to move from being just a receiver to a, um, giving to others. But my point here is that it's only when you set your mind on it that it does its work. You have to focus your mind on it. Because it's in letting the meaning of the words settle into your heart that life comes. And since we've been going through Psalms, how can I leave out that amazing Psalm? Well, we haven't got to Psalm this one yet, but we will. Who knows when? (laughs) Because there's 150 Psalms. But this is that Psalm that celebrates the Word of God in practically every single one of its 176 verses. Psalm 119, you're familiar with that, many of us. Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the whole Bible. And it's one big celebration of the Word of God, really. It's, uh, it also calls the Word of God His promises, the ways, the law, the statutes, all those different kinds of words um, that's, that David uses there to describe what God's Word is, is about. So here are just a few quick highlights. This is verse 9. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. So that's how you live your life, using the Bible, right? Using God's word. Chapter verse 37. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things. Give me life in your ways. So there you go. There's that life that comes through your ways, your word. is God's truth. Verse 50. This is my comfort in my affliction, that your promise gives me life. There's a comfort aspect too, and to life again through the word through the promise of God verse 97 oh how I love your law 
not many people say they love the Lord, do they? But this is because we're talking about it as the Word of God. It's my meditation all the day. So there you go. Meditation, you're thinking about it, the meaning of it all the time. Verse 105, this is a well-known one. Your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So there, it shows us the way to go. So it's clearly... Is characteristic of godly people that they love God's written word and it and hold it in very high regard. That's certainly what David did there. And they recognise that it's primary or the primary means of their spiritual growth. Now you have to be careful with that statement because there are plenty of people who read a lot of Bible but never grow. The problem is they don't read it relationally. They just read it as a text. You know, I know all this stuff but they need to read it relationally. And that's the key. We read it to know God, not to know about God only. Okay, We get to know God personally. And so before we complete our quick explanation of the principles of spiritual growth, I'm just going to look at something several of us here today are probably quite familiar with being uh, in our Bible studies. It's the growth works picture. And I'm showing you this because some of us are more pictorial learners, right? So something like this can help us know a bit better. So here it is. There's the growth words diagram that we look at every single week. <laughs> we'll build up. Now, for those of us who are doing the course who have done it before, um, you'll know that it takes us through the picture pretty much from the top down, so from the fruit all the way through, the fruit to the root, if you like. But I'm going to go the reverse way this morning. Um, I'd just like to make the point of where everything begins. And that's with Jesus as the bedrock. So there's the in Christ bit down there, so foundation of the whole shebang it's Jesus Christ so all of our spiritual growth and all of our spiritual life our eternal life is founded upon the person and work of Jesus Christ so he holds it up and he holds it together he's the one solid foundation of the whole thing then on that basis literally we can have a relationship with God now that's what the soil represents is our relationship with God and of course, this is, rem- sorry, uh, just to clarify, yeah, our relationship with God starts when we're planted in that soil. Our, the seed representing us is planted in that soil. And that reminds us a little bit of uh, John twelve twenty four, where Jesus refers to, uh, mostly to himself, as a seed that has to die. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. So Jesus dying has meant that all of us can have eternal life. Okay, that's pretty fundamental. It's what's the heart of the gospel, isn't it? That's, that's, that's it. But what he does for us sets the pattern for what we have to do as well. We need to fall to the ground and die to ourselves and to the ways of the world. And when we do that, that's when the Holy Spirit moves in and starts to shine on us and in us like the sun and that's in the picture there and our relationship with God causes our seed to sprout and ultimately the goal is of course to grow up and be a tree and bear fruit Okay, so that's kind of the the picture that's a quick summary of everything above the ground there and the point of doing this is to show you the other source of energy in the process this is what I'm getting to and that is the river that the tree is tapping into. And you can see that it says this represents the word of God. It's the river there. So often scripture itself refers to the word of God as something like water. Uh, for washing or refreshing and nourishing. Because if you take that water away and the ground goes bone dry, what will happen to the tree? It'll die. It'll just wither and die. So if it's all dried up, do you think it's going to produce any fruit? No. No way. The tree must be in contact constantly with the source of fresh water to enable the processes of life to work. And the same, we've got to keep drinking, same thing. So that symbolizes the fact that we must be in, like I said, constant contact with the Word of God to enable our spiritual growth to work. Our true spiritual formation, if you like. So the Word of God is the fuel and the Holy Spirit is the agent. So they're the two sources in that picture. So before we actually get into looking at spiritual formation itself as it's currently practiced, 
there's something else we need to be clear about and that uh, is seen in the passage we had read before in Colossians 1. And we're going to focus on just on two verses at this point, just verses 27 and 28, because these two verses show us the link between growing in Christ and having Christ in us. And so we'll just do verse 27. We'll look at that first. He's talking about the church, also called the saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So what's the mystery he's referring to? Now, keep in mind, a mystery in the way the Bible uses the term is something that has always been planned by God, but not revealed until the proper time and by his chosen agent, whoever it is, chosen messenger. So here the messenger is Paul, and the mystery is that Christ will be in you if you are one of the church. So that was something that hadn't really been considered up to that point. And the church, of course, is simply all the people in the world who have put their faith in Jesus. I'm not saying only people in this church are saved. That's not what it means. <laughs> it's the church as a whole. And so Christ in you is another way of saying that the Holy Spirit is in you because the Holy Spirit is also the Spirit of Christ. So, so when does Christ go into you? And that's an important question. Are you born that way? Are you born with Christ in you? No, you're not. And that's very important to understand. So the unregenerate person is made in the image of God, yes, but that's not the same thing as saying that Christ is in that person, him or her. And if we get this point right, we'll save ourselves a mountain of confusion and, and error later on. So a lot of people uh, miss that and then it takes them off into weird places. So let's get that straight. The Spirit of Christ only moves in upon a person's conscious repentance. And that's why everyone must repent, which means to change your allegiance from the world to Jesus Christ, to turn around like that. So your allegiance is no longer with the world, it's with Jesus Christ. And also means to turn away from sins as well as, as a result of that. But it obviously takes time. So, so Paul preached Christ, verse 28. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. So that's his goal there, to everyone mature in Christ. So now this is a very important verse. So see, how does maturity come about? From what Paul says here, what does he say? It comes about through teaching. Yep, and he's, his first one is warning people. So you know, he's warning people that unrepentant people will be damned and teaching everyone with all wisdom. So what will be the result? Well, what's he's aiming, he's aiming for? Everyone to be mature in Christ. That's the process that he's trying to make happen there. And, or God's working through him to make that happen. So, um, so pre presenting everyone mature in Christ is another way of saying, um, or the, the whole process, sorry, is another way of saying it, to preach Jesus by warning with the word of God and teaching with the word of God. So the warning is with the word of God. You know, this is where you're going to be going if you're not, um, you don't respond. And teaching with the word of God that people will grow spiritually. That's what it ha how it happens. So hopefully you can see that in that verse there. That's the process. He, he has that process inherent in that comment. All right, so to summarize then before we move on. So we've concluded, I'm going to give you three points that we've concluded. Firstly, part, point A, the word of God is the fuel for our spiritual growth. Okay, so that's number one. I'll stick to A, B, C, sorry. That's A. <laughs> B, I don't want to confuse things. B, the Word of God is conveyed by understanding it, uh, specifically by reading it and understanding it, or else verbally by warning and teaching. You can learn the Word of God that way too, obviously. That's what Colossians 1 says. So that's the uh, second part B. C, Christ only comes into us when we repent. So we're not born with Christ in us. That's the third one, C. Okay, so we'll carry these three points with us and use them um, to, to compare this, these spiritual formation things and see how they stack up. So the first one we'll look at is contemplative prayer. Now, this can take many forms, contemplative prayer. And I'll give you three examples. We've got centering prayer, breath prayer, or just silence. 
But before we can figure out if they're safe or not, we need to know, obviously, what these things are. What do, how do you do them? So first we'll look at the centering prayer there, which is really similar to breath prayer, because in both cases the aim is to focus on a single thing and stay on it. Okay, that's kind of the general idea of both of those. Now obviously when Christians promote it, and talking about centering prayer specifically, the thing to be focused on has some kind of Christian or biblical origin. Okay, so people might choose to focus on a word. Perhaps they might just think of the word grace, for example. That's just what some people do. So the aim is to be you know, sitting comfortably in a place where you won't be distracted and just keep that word in your mind. So whenever a thought other than the one, other than that word that you've chosen comes in, the person's instructed to push it away and keep their mind just on that word. So that's the idea of being centered, right? That's, that's what they say. So the idea is much the same with breath prayer, like I said, except that it can also be a, a phrase. So and one popular one is, um, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. Or it can be some short Bible verse, but the person then repeats that word or phrase over and over, verbally, but very quietly, sort of under, your, under the breath. Hence the name, breath prayer. So um, now... Do these things calm you down? Absolutely, yes, they do. They're very effective at helping settle your thoughts, obviously. But we're coming at it from the angle that asks, does this actually do anything for your spiritual growth? Or does it hinder your spiritual growth? Well, let's look at the repetitive aspect. Now, I've mentioned this before, previous, uh, recent, recently, but... What happens when you repeat something too many times? I think we've all had this situation happen. You know, it loses meaning. That's right. Yep, if it can be any word, or, but if you repeat it too many times, you find that meaning just starts to lose, lose it in your mind. Well, what did we see about how spiritual growth actually happens? Do you remember the, the meaning is supposed to be highlighted in our hearts, not lost? So right there we can see there might be some problems with this because even though the substance of what you're repeating might be good, you might even just repeat the, the word Jesus, but a lot of people do that. But if you repeat it too many times, it basically becomes a mantra. And then you're starting to get into the realms of Eastern mysticism, right? So in fact, some people do get into a trance-like state by just repeating these words, even Jesus. And of course, they, they call this good, but it's actually extremely dangerous because, as we've said, I've said many times, disengaging the mind provides an open door for demonic entities to come in. And even one of the modern heroes of contemplative prayer movement notices, notes this as a possibility. So Richard Foster, he's very well known in this field. He wrote in his 1992 book, Prayer, Finding the Heart's True Home. He says this, and I'll quote it in, uh, in full, sort of. I also want to give a word of precaution. In the silent contemplation of God, we're entering deeply into the spiritual realm and there is such a thing as supernatural guidance that is not divine guidance. That's true. While the Bible does not give us a lot of information on the nature of the spiritual world, we do know there are various orders of spiritual beings and some of them are definitely not in cooperation with God and his way. But for now, I want to encourage you to learn and practice prayers of protection. All dark and evil spirits must now leave. Now, if someone is genuinely praying to God, why would they have to worry about encountering evil spirits? To me, it seems more likely an explanation that you're entering territory you shouldn't be entering. And I'll note there also tends to be an attitude through this book that this, this is only for advanced Christians. Actually, he specifically says that. This is only for those who are down the track a bit. And to me, that's another alarm bell. Once you have this division between enlightened ones who are good enough to do something and the un unenlightened masses, that's concerning as well. I believe. So just keep those things in mind. But back to our three forms of contemplative prayer. And to discuss the third one, I'll give you a personal example, and it's a very recent personal example, showing you this is relevant. <laughs> this is something I encountered this week at the Church of Christ conference. Um, now, you might be shocked by that, but here we go. So I was at a workshop this week where we engaged in this third one, silence prayer. So what we did, uh, we sat quietly he said 20 minutes he's going to set his alarm for 20 minutes and we'll sit there and you are to keep a, nothing in your mind you are to sit there and if a thought comes in 
just practice pushing that thought away. And that was the 20 minutes. That's what we had to do for 20 minutes. Keep your mind empty. Um, now, how does that sound to you after what we've just been talking about? Um, it's not for focusing on God, but the fundamental assumption of this type of prayer is that God is in the stillness. That's, that's the idea. Okay? And I get how they come to that. They, um, they often point to Psalm 46 verse 10, right? And that's, be still and know that I am God. And, but this verse, or well, the question is, is this verse talking about personal reflection of the individual? Not at all. Psalm 46 is all about judgment. When Jesus comes to put down all the rebellious systems and powers on earth. And if you read the whole thing, that's very obvious. But I'll just start from verse 9, and you can sort of pick that up anyway from verse 9. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. So you can see there, what's actually happening is God is putting his foot down and he's breaking his silence to that point by shouting, stop it. That's what it really means. So the stillness being called for has exactly zero to do with personal reflection and everything to do with telling the world to stop its rebellion and raging against God. Now, I hope that's clear, but please don't misunderstand me. Of course, quietness before God is a good thing. And we absolutely, absolutely do not get enough of that in our lives these days, most of us at least. So it, it's a good thing to be quiet before God, but this is not the verse to promote it. And so when we sing the song, you know, uh, be still and know, you know that one? It's, it's fine to sing that song, but just keep in mind the true meaning behind that phrase. Okay? So it's a bit, a bit more gutsy than you think. So let's just summarize contemplative prayer then using our three criteria. So this is what we're trying to carry through and compare it. So for A, that the word of God is the fuel. It's certainly not true for silence prayer, is it? Not when your specific aim is to have nothing on your mind. So if God's word is the fuel, how much spiritual growth can you expect to get from this? Nothing. Exactly nothing. And the other two forms of prayer aren't really any better since it's the meaning that's required. So they kind of fail on both points, A and B. And B is that, that the word of God is conveyed by understanding it. So understanding is not the issue in these kinds of prayer. In fact, how it's presented is that it bypasses the understanding or our understanding, as if that's the way to deeper spirituality. And so many people will say that. Well, it is a way to a kind of spirituality, but not the kind we should be engaging in. And point C there does, doesn't really apply here very strongly, so we'll just move on now and we'll talk about that one a little bit later. You can, you can apply it, but I'll, I'll leave that for now. So let's go to the next one, labyrinths. So a labyrinth is different to a maze, in case you weren't aware. I had to look this up, I didn't know, of course in that there's only one path. It just takes you on a long and winding journey into the centre and then back out again. And there are three stages according to its promoters. So the first stage is purgation. So you shed the distractions and opening your heart and mind as you move towards the centre as you follow this path around through all the all candles like on the picture. And that one, but there's different kinds. And then once you reach the centre, it's illumination. They say, you spend some time there in prayer and meditation to receive what God has for you. And then finally, union, which occurs once you leave the labyrinth and you are then, I'll quote, uh, joining God, your higher power, or the healing forces at work in the world. So that's the idea there. Now, the spiritual heritage in itself of this is enough to be of concern, as labyrinths are well known in both ancient and modern pagan and New Age rituals. Uh, it doesn't automatically make things wrong just because they use them, but um, you've got to be concerned. And they have long been incorporated into Catholic tradition, and more recently it's what, in what's called the Emerging Church Movement. But let's look at it from the biblical perspective, which I have summarised in our three points. Is the Word of God used to fuel the growth? No. I mean, I guess you could read the Bible as you go on this walk, but not as normally done. Uh, therefore, point B is irrelevant, right? Which is a problem in itself, point B. 
um, that it's not there. So there's no understanding. And point C, what part does repentance for sin or acknowledgement or, or of unworthiness play in this process? Nothing, it's just a ritual. And not like communion, where acknowledgement of sin and recognition of Jesus is basically the point of it, right? That's why we do communion, because it helps us focus. Or like baptism, which is a, you know, it's a whole reenactment of the dying to sin and rising again to new life in Jesus. That's, it's got meaning as part of the actual action. So I think we should say that labyrinths have no place in Christian worship. So next we should look, we'll look at Lectio Divina. Now, years ago I went to a camp where we actually did this one as well, and there are many ways you can do it, but the basic idea is that you either form a group and do it out loud, or you can do it by yourself alone. And what you do is you read the Bible, or sometimes some other text, in a slow and deliberate way, allowing it to really percolate in your mind. And its goal is to... It says there, promote communion with God and provide special, special spiritual insights. Now, as it's described there, there's not anything really wrong there, is it, what we've seen so far? Well, certainly if it's the Bible, that's the focus, at least. Um, how can that be a problem? Well, it's, it's more about where it leads, okay? So let's look at that. First, look at the definition there. It's designed to promote special spiritual insights. But... To be honest, this is lazy. It's a bit like trying to take a shortcut. And God doesn't reward laziness. The way to special spiritual insight, in my experience, is doing the hard yards, analysing the text in the original language if possible. But um, I don't think that's out of reach for anyone because any, anyone can do that. Now that we have the internet, you can find the original language and get the words, what they mean. So... It's, it's really it's prayerfully digging and cross-referencing and looking at commentaries that more often leads to insights and which obviously take time and effort. And sure, many of us have had those times where something leaps out of the page of the Bible to us and we know God is impressing that on our hearts in a new way. That happens to, to many of us. Um, and that doesn't necessarily take effort. But, but I'm just saying as a general rule, um, that's, it's, that's really the exception to the rule. But the rule is expressed in Hebrews 11, verse 6. I've probably never heard this described as a rule, but I'll use it that way. That God rewards those who diligently seek him. Okay, So that's, that's the heart we need to have towards God. Lord, how do I know you better? And yes, some may say Lectio Divina is diligence in prayer. And taking your time to carefully digest a passage certainly is worthwhile. But as I said, it's more about where it leads. Because the next steps in Lectio Divina, and this is going to sound familiar, include pausing over individual words. And you take that word and turn it over and over in your mind. But as you'll recall, this starts to head into the same territory as contemplative prayer. And the word begins to lose meaning and you can easily lead you into more of a trance-like state where you know you probably shouldn't be going. And so because I've covered that bit already, I won't badger that too much now. But just be aware that some of Lectio Divina can be okay when it's about the actual meaning of the text in context because you can grow spiritually on that food, right? That's the fuel. You're actually ingesting the fuel, if you like. It's probably mixing my metaphors there, but anyway. But when the meaning fades away and the, and the meaning becomes whatever you personally want it to mean, which is something Lectio Divina actually actively encourages, that's when we hit problems spiritually. So, so just be careful with that one. Now, finally today, I just want to touch on something that some of my friends are into, um, a system of personal evaluation called an Enneagram. Now, it tends to be marketed in Christian circles as, a, as simply a personality assessment tool. And, uh, but the, the way it, quite, it works is, quite actually, is complicated, quite complicated. So I'll try and boil it down as best I can in about a minute. So its goal is for an individual to reach self-actualization. Becoming the best you possible. Well, that's, now, becoming the best you is fine, of course, but how do you go about it? And so how an Enneagram goes about it, so what it does, it, it breaks our personalities down into nine different types. As you can see on the chart there, so I don't know which one you think you might be, but mostly, but the point is that there's uh, 
you might be one main one, but you have what wings of other kinds and all that kind of thing. That's, that's the language they use. But it says the person understands their fundamental type and how they relate to some of the other types, like I said, um, both within themselves but also towards others, how this kind of person relates to that kind of person. They begin to see what kind of learned behaviours they've been using to compensate for their hurts and get by in life. Because you know, we all have experiences in life which hurt us or shape us in some way and we all react to that in different ways. So the Enneagram seeks to reveal to the person how they've subconsciously reacted to those events and pains according to their own God-given personality uh, with the aim of therefore being able to undo and forgive some of the problems in their own life. Now, I'll put it like that, it doesn't seem too bad. That's, that's, that's a good goal to have and try and understand the, what's caused you to have pain. But it's only when you get to the heart of what Enneagram is all about that the false foundations become more obvious. Because what you find is that, underlying, that the underlying assumption is that each person is inherently good. And it takes a while to dig to, to find that. So that's right, it unfortunately denies or at least obscures the fact of original sin, the fact that we're all born sinners. And so because it comes from the assumption that a person is naturally good, that means the primary source of the bad stuff in a person's life is only how they've naturally and understandably reacted to the hurts that have come their way. So nothing is your fault, basically. That's the thing, that you're naturally good and all these things that are bad in your life are because everything else. It's not your own reaction. Or it's not, not your own heart. And that's the fact that you know, nothing is your fault. That's the idea. That's the fundamental reason why this is so popular. No fault, no blame. I'm a good person. So, for example, a loyalist, so I'll circle it, a loyalist would naturally react to the death of a loved one differently than would an individualist or whatever situation in life. Okay, so that's how it works. So we'll just circle those two examples. But there's all the rest, of course. So this means if you can peel back the layers of your hurts, which will be different for each person, and get to the real you, then you should be able to overcome them and life will go better for you because you're getting more to the real you, the good you, in the middle. Your natural goodness will shine through. That's the idea. But the fact is it's only Jesus in us who can fix our lives properly. That's good news, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Sure, a better, a better understanding of how you tick in yourself can be helpful. I'm not denying that. But the fact remains that Jesus is the saviour, Jesus is the healer, and most importantly, only Jesus is the forgiver. So many people still hold on to their hurts and the consequences of them, and they think they can use something like the Enneagram to get back to their real selves. But if we recognise that our real self, our real heart, is like Jeremiah 17.9 says deceitful beyond cure and desperately wicked that's when we confess our sin as sin and not only ever pass it off as some justifiable reaction to difficult circumstances now that does happen okay there are that as well but we have got to remember what the core of the problem is and when we reach that place the place of repentance that's when jesus comes in and brings that forgiveness and genuine restoration because those hurts are paid for Right, That's the thing, that those hurts are paid for. And you can know you're a loved child of your Creator. That's the greatest thing ever. Okay, to be a, a child of God. You belong in a family, an eternal family. And living in that reality makes the concept of self-actualization look like the withered up Im imitation that it is. Self-actualization is nothing. We would need to be, no, we're children of God. So yes, the Enneagram fails at point C on the summary chart there, so... Look at the summary chart. We're not naturally good, so we need the only one who is, who came and died for us to bring us a whole new life, an eternal one. We don't need to try and revive the old dead and scarred heart. Okay, we get a new heart. Okay, so there you have it. I hope that's been enlightening in some way. And remember, I went through this a bit um, in a kind of a this is good and this isn't kind of way today, like it's, like it's a bit of a list. And th that's not really what I want you to get out of it, you know, you know, what's good and what's bad. What I hope I can do for you in doing this today is to give you some tools to make your own decisions about what's worthwhile participating in and what's not. Because I don't know what's going to come your way. Everyone's got different options and challenges that God throws there.
comes across the path. So we can't have everything on a list of approved and, and not approved, right? So what I, what I can give you is that way to test what is good and what's not, rather than a list. So if we can carry in our mind a few of those simple principles, um, hopefully that's what will help guard us from going the wrong way. And even then, that can become a crutch too, you know, <laughs> if we're not careful, because the best protection is even better than having three points to test it on. It's the Holy Spirit of Christ in you if you're a believer. Because remember, it's relational ultimately in our hearts. That's what God himself helps us to see the truth. He's there to speak to us and guide us. And as we get to know him better through genuine conversation in prayer and reading his word, then, then when these things come along, our spirit will perhaps give us a, a check if something's not right. So they're the fundamental means the Bible describes for us and, and the ways, um, you know, reading the word and everything, that's the ways that we see in people in the Bible, that's how they did it. So that's how we should do it as well. So, so let's do them as well. Let's pray. Father, uh, we're not at any time where um, there are things that no one else has ex- experienced. Um, challenges to our spiritual growth have come right through history, Lord, but um, in our time, there are some unique things, but the fundamental truth of all the all these things, Lord, is that it's good and bad, um, you versus Satan, Lord, and help us to listen to you as you receive us uh, receive yourself into our into our lives through faith and you can guide us with your spirit in us and by your word so help us lord to be discerning not to be critical or judgmental but to be aware lord that the plans of the devil are very clever so thank you for your word to help us discern and your spirit to guide us so thank you for this time in jesus name amen